Good uh, morning, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me now. Um, thank you all for getting up this early. Um, this um, talk, uh, this is going to be me, Oliver. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Linux Sun C community. Um, there's various people that don't know how to pronounce it, so this is my way. Uh, everybody has a different interpretation, I guess. Um, it's going to be a pretty busy schedule. Uh, I want to tell you a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm very anxious to tell you a lot, uh, and I hope it's, it's very interesting, but um, we're a little pressed for time. It looks more than it really is, um, but um, the first thing I'm going to tell you is this, uh, what Sun Xi now really is. Um, first of all, no. It's not sushi. Uh, it sounds like sushi, I guess, if you pronounce it that way, but it really is not. Um, could it be related to the sun or the Greek letter C? Maybe. Um, could it be related to uh, Sun Tzu? Possibly. To be fair, we don't really know. But what we do know, of course, is that it's a system on a chip. Um, who knows or has not heard of uh, what a system on a chip is? Oh, at least one hand. Um, a system on a chip basically is your regular CPU. Uh, it could be an x86 or an ARM processor or MIPS. And um, they add up bunch of features, like a USB controller, a serial ATA controller, uh, all sorts of buses, all into one chip to make it very easy to create a board uh, or a tablet or a PC with little components and everything nicely integrated. We know that um, our, the chip we're going to be talking about are called the Sun 4i. Um, we don't know what the first chip actually was called, the first series. It's probably Sun something, maybe just Sun. We don't know. It's too old. Uh, nobody really had heard of it or had it. We know uh, from, from historical research that um, the, the real old first discovered uh, chips was called the Sun II or Sun II, I guess. And from there on, uh, we know there's a Sun III. And obviously, uh, the geeks that we are, Sun XI or you know, replace the numeral for a variable is where this comes from. Now that you know what a Sun Xi is, or what an ARM stock is, I'll tell you a bit about myself. I've been a Linux enthusiast for 15 years, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I've administrated several servers, uh, desktops, I guess, too, and I've been a user for pretty much almost the same length. I've been uh, a user and developer of uh, Sunxi for, I guess, a little bit, a year and a half, maybe a little bit more, could be two, almost two years now. And I started actually as a regular user, working a little bit on the wiki uh, page that we have, that I'll mention briefly later on. Um, and then I slowly enrolled in, you know, submitting patches, working on, on, on features, things like that. Um, I'm also just you know, look, you know a little bit of me. Uh, the official um, digital television uh, scan files maintainer. Um, if you ever heard of DVB-T or DVB-C or DVB-S, which is you know satellite reception or terrestrial reception, uh, those files are stored somewhere on the internet. I maintain those. Um, and I have been a small time, very small time, a kernel contributor. I've sent a few patches that have been accepted, unrelated to Sunxi and even including Sunxi already. Um, and I was asked by Pack Publishing to uh, write a book about these uh, SOCs, uh, beginner style, you know, for people that are just starting into, uh, you know, working with uh, SOCs and, and, and or this one specifically. Uh, it should be, if I manage to keep my timelines uh, released in July. I mean, just kind of. The uh, Sun Xi's, uh, SOCs are made by a company called Allwinner, and it's only fair to at least um, mention them and give you a short, brief history of what they have done. Allwinner Technology is a Chinese company. Um, they do not have their own factories. They, uh, as you saw in the first slide of what is an SOC, they just puzzle together. They buy several cores, combine them. They say they even develop some of these cores and combine them and you know, produce these uh, chips. 
I'm not going to read up all that. It's just some infographics that uh, is from them, just so you get, you get an idea of, of you know, what they are and, and what they do. Um, one of the reasons why, why this uh, SOC is so uh, popular today is that when they started in 2001, is uh, they got some government grants and were able to offer these chips for very, very cheap. I think uh, if you buy them in huge bulks, you could get them for seven US dollars a piece, which was uh, at that time amazing, uh, and even uh, caused a small revolution in China as all these tablet manufacturers that want to have the cheapest parts, don't care really about what it is, they just want the cheapest parts. They started to drop orders from, from uh, RK or, or MediaTek and just swapped all over to all winner because it was so cheap. Um, that um, made it that there were a lot of chips uh, from all winner in a lot of tablets, a lot of set of boxes, and so the community from their own group. Uh, they claim, and this is verbatim from them, that in 2003 they had 15% of the SOC market share just below uh, Apple, which is, you know, to be fair, pretty amazing. Um, they initially did power management units. That's where, where they started. When they probably split off or started their company, they did power management units. The same units that are in the tablets that uh, these uh, chips are in. An interesting... Um, these two chips, which were the AXP152 and 209, are, were one of the, the first and, I guess, uh, one of the later chips that are still used in, uh, today. Um, as I mentioned before, there is the, uh, the really old um, Sun 2i, Sun 3i, and even, you know, whatever was before that. Um, they call them, Alwinner calls them the F-series. That's where, you know, they really kind of started with their first SOCs. Um, the Alwinner A10, which was released in 2011, is what you know, I just previously mentioned, the most popular and most used SOC out there. It's a simple single core CPU, but uh, because it's all over the world, so, you know, so, so massively used, that's why we're here today. They later released the A13 and the NTS. Don't ask me you know, the, the sense in, in the naming uh, of their chips. Um, they're just cheaper variants of the A10. They removed some features or disabled, or maybe they were just bin parts um, and just, uh, you know, resold them as cheaper devices, even cheaper than the US, seven US dollars that we, we mentioned earlier. And then just recently they announced their, or announced, it's already widely in use, it's their uh, A20 dual core, uh, uh, slightly uh, slower, I guess, uh, com you know, for single, if you compare single processing uh, or single core uh, processing. Uh, but because it's there too, uh, it's, it's more useful, I think. This slide is very interesting. It's uh, verbatim from, uh, from their marketing strategy. It lists their strengths. Um, the, left, the top and the left one are, you know, it's more marketing, it's not really interesting. But the third one, the open source support, is where it becomes interesting to all of us, because since we are all really interested in the open sourceness of everything. Um, one interesting fact uh, I really want to mention here, though, is that also, again, from their marketing slides, is they uh, portray the um, GPL version 3 uh, for their whole you know, SDK or whatever. Um, they really want to push uh, open source. They really think they're open source, yet we already know that they're violating the GPL themselves, even though claiming this on several occasions. They do try to improve. And we do have uh, one member in, uh, in uh, the community that um, does try to uh, enforce it uh, with them. Uh, it's Luke Layton, I think. Um, he uh, has his own company. He works with uh, chips like that. And, and he does try to push them to uh, release, with um, you know, very success, to uh, release the uh, sources that are missing. Um, I'll tr briefly touch now on uh, our community, because that's also a really big part of this talk and of this uh, chip, I guess, to us. Um, as I said, we're, this is our logo. This, we're the Sun Xi, uh, Sun Xi community. Um, we have been around for a while, but before, um, we actually were part of the, or part of, uh, we work with the Rumbus Tech uh, company. Uh, they. Uh, started to work or develop a uh, little development platform where um, 
you could swap out uh, your processor card, change it into a tablet, change it into a uh, set-up box, change it into whatever you wanted, um, which is an interesting project. I guess most of the early people started to get interested uh, in that project that way. Um, problem was, though, they used the A10 stock because it was uh, so open source friendly, um, but they could switch to another stock anytime. Um, they also uh, were more interested in the hardware aspect of it and the whole system. And some of us were actually just interested or mostly interested in the kernel that comes with it. Um, so we kind of split up from, uh, from <coughs> the, uh, I think I, got, I guess they called the ARM network community or I'm not even actually, actually sure. Uh, so we split up using their mailing list, their IEC channel, you know, their resources, so that we could uh, nicely separate uh, everything, and, and it made sense. We have been growing very steadily over the last, I think, yeah, year, year and a quarter that we split up from them. Uh, we started with just a handful of people, I suppose, and right now we have about 600 uh, mailing list users. Most of them, of course, are lurkers, but still. Uh, 600 registers, mailing list users. About an average 130 people are either idling or speaking in the IRC channel, which is, you know, pretty nice. Unfortunately, only about 20 active developers. That's really a rough estimate, you know, if it's 30. All right, I'm sorry uh, for those 10, pe 10 people I missed. Um, we would love to see more developers, but uh, we're, we're doing really good, though. These are the places where you can find us. Um, we have our own website, well, website, our own wiki, um, where everybody can make a, create an account and start you know, editing the wiki. We have our, our own IRC channel, uh, and we have our own mailing list, or soon-to-be mailing list there. It does accept mails. Uh, right now, we're just still using Google Groups. There's some people who object to that. Um, now that you know a little bit about um, what All Winner does, what we do, um, or I'm going to tell you what we really do. Uh, Linux Sun uh, is not really just about Linux. Um, it's one of the main people's interests, I suppose, most of the, what main, most people use. But we also do uh, work on the bootloader, um, which uh, I'll briefly uh, go over now. There is actually quite a few bootloaders uh, for uh, the SOC in question here. Uh, there is U-Boot, which was um, and we call it the Lychee branch of U-Boot, I suppose. Uh, it's what Allwinner actually released, um, but it does depend on a, a, we call them boot zero, boot one. Um, it's a, uh, it used to be proprietary. It's one of those things Luke mentioned to uh, get the source code from, as we found it was infringing on the GPL. Uh, so technically, it's open source now. It's, uh, I don't think anybody ever managed or even tried to build it. Um, it sits on every all winner device with a NAND flash ROM. It sits on there in a, in a, you know, on a partition and, and it, it's responsible for bringing up the tablet, initializing the memory, and then it switches over to what we call their U-boot. We have some, made some small improvements to it, but uh, nothing major. Our own U-boot actually though, um, we call it the Sunxi U-boot obviously, um, just a different branch, is up to, uh, is a, a, compared to the main, main line, uh, we have not mer merged it all upstream yet. It um, needs a lot of cleaning up, but it is very fun fully functional. Um, it does only boot MMC. Uh, you can only boot from the SD card, which can be a problem, but most developers actually do use that way, um, since you can easily swap out memory cards, so it's, it's very nice. Uh, the memory initialization, which is most, the most important task, task of the uh, bootloader for us, uh, since the kernel can't do that, um, is actually done in this U-boot, which is why it's so interesting to us. Um, it was uh, donated, I guess you could say, from one of the uh, former AllWinner employees who worked with AllWinner on this. Um, and it's based, I know from, from, from experience that it's based on boot zero, actually. Then there is someone crazy enough to have uh, tried to, or started to boot, uh, port it to bare boot. Um, I don't know what bare boot is other than it's a U-boot 2 fork, or U-boot fork, they call it U-boot 2. Uh, I guess it's just uh, one of those forks. They forked, I think, before um, the Sun Xi stuff got in it and, and added it later. And then somebody is crazy enough to actually port it to core boot. 
uh, and that person uh, was getting along quite well. He actually fixed some bugs uh, in RU boot. Um, he did find out though that uh, it wasn't as easy as he initially thought. There are some things that Corbo doesn't really even uh, consider yet, or you know, does, hasn't found a straight way to to do like booting from MMC, uh, for example. I haven't followed it, you know, perfectly to the letter, but. Now that we've talked about the bootloader, um, one of the next things, of course, is when you, you bring up one of these chips is uh, the operating system, naturally. Um, obviously, I, I shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, Linux. It runs well, um, it's well supported. Um, and we know that uh, there's patches for FreeBSD going. And from what I know, the, it also boots and it works. Um, if anybody saw the Tizen, Titsen, I don't know, uh, uh, at home talk yesterday, they actually mentioned they did it or, or doing it uh, with all winner CPUs. And then there's Firefox OS. Uh, if you haven't heard the news, uh, Firefox is, uh, or Mozilla is announcing their own tablet based on the A31, I think. But more on that later. I'll burn them for that a little bit later. And it's not supported yet, but somebody showed interest or, or wanted to get help to port uh, Minix to it. Now all these operating systems, or Linux really for us, um, doesn't mean that much, it's just a kernel. Um, but you need really need a distro uh, to support that kernel. And we have quite a few actually. Um, I do want to, I'm not going to mention everything, why it's important or why it's interesting. Uh, I do want you to know that um, the first one, Fedora, is uh, being ported by one of the uh, uh, Red Hat employees in his spare time. He works with the community. And I think it is the best supported uh, image or, or uh, root FS that we have right now. It, it works, as long as the device is supported, it works smoothest. You just uh, pop it on your SD card, you run the setup from a shell, and it just works. Um, the other ones are either um, created by um, fans, I suppose, users. Um, they may, you know, they hack a little bit their own uh, root of us together, or, or it's possible, you know, they, they, well, yeah, they hacked it together and, and they offer this image for uh, for use. Um, or the Linara one, it's just a generic root of us that just works. Uh, they all still are just images. You know, somebody puts all the right components together, and there you go, image. Uh, at least I tried with Debian. Uh, you can actually just bootstrap it. So you actually manage to boot Fedora, Hans, Hans's uh, image, uh, and from there on bootstrap the entire system as the installer normally would uh, to one of these boards. Um, and I do mention specifically not Android because we don't have a real community uh, supported Android version, um, which is strange, you would think. There are uh, replicant, in, or replicant is, is a big work in progress. I think Paul, who is maybe around here, uh, oh, there he is. <laughs> he said that uh, you know he's going to start to work on it. He said that for at least three months now, I think. <laughs> um, which is uh, you know very cool to have, of course, and why I'll mention briefly later. Uh, but it should be you know quite possible to actually port replicant to it. And there are. Um, and that's why I said no community support. There are uh, tarballs with uh, CyanogenMod mode for it. Uh, a user built it, you know, offers it the whole thing for download. It's, it, somebody did it. We don't know that person. It doesn't interact with the community, and that's okay. But um, that's why I said it's not community supported. We don't, you know, we don't know what updates are coming or, or nothing, or if it even still works today. And then there is the all winner SDK Android version. Um, it's loaded with uh, GPL violations, we know, because I know they use certain parts that uh, they don't give us. Most of them is the touchscreen controller in tablets, which is weird, really. It's a very simple microcontroller uh, on an IT, I squared two bus, I, two, I, I squared C bus. And um, it shouldn't be that you know, special, but they just get you know, bought from manufacturers, and God knows what happens then. Um, and of course, they ship. Uh, only they're violating a uh, bootloader, which I said earlier, we do have the source of uh, for boot zero, boot one, but only for, I think, one specific chip, 820, I believe, it might be. 
I'm seeing question marks there all for my, my friends. Um, so while we do have it and we don't really need it badly because we have our own U-boot uh, support uh, quite well, it's still shipped that way and officially it's still a GPL violation. Um, I early, earlier mentioned you have your Linux operating system, I, I guess, I don't know what really it goes under. Uh, I do wanna start talking about the kernels um, that we support or are supported. As I mentioned earlier, the Leachy branch of kernel, or you know, that's it's how it comes, um, is we, there's four or three versions right now. Mostly found still today, I guess, is the 3.0 stuff. Um, that's what they initially brought their SDK out under. That's what most uh, uh, kernels are, um, or uh, tablets are shipped with. I think somebody's messing uh, with the volume of the all right, uh, the 3.0 is what they're mostly shipped with. Uh, and so that's what we see a lot. And it's important because as I said earlier, these touchscreen uh, blobs, these touchscreen drivers are still um, depending on 3.0 specifically. 3.3 was um, their first next major uh, version that they started to ship with the, the, S the SDKs. And we also see a lot of users, I guess, that built their own kernels based on the SDK asking questions about the 3.3. And I guess it's, it's slowly replacing 3.0. But as you all know, um, OEMs, manufacturers, users, don't really upgrade their software, their kernels, their tablets. Uh, and we recently got um, a very interesting release, uh, I think t two months ago, six weeks ago. We've got... Um, their 3.4 version, which is um, having patches actually from the community. It's the first time that we actually seen stuff being used by them. They actually, this, the 3.0 to 3.3 step they did, they ignored everything we did. They just kept on doing their own thing in their own horrible way, really horrible way. And um, so it's really interesting to see at least the, the notice and they did pull back, pull back something from 3.8 uh, to our kernels. Then we have the Sonic C kernels. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we split off or, or used the code dump that we got from uh, 3.0, and um, we started to use that. We actually have two branches, the staging branch where all the development goes on, which is then ported to a stable branch. Um, 3.0 uh, is where we start forking, we start to make improvements. I think we actually did the 2.3.4 um, switch upgrade ourselves. Um, I think we did, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Um, this was before my time. Um, and 3.4 is where all the work gets done right now. Um, we actually have an experiment, and maybe the order of the last two items should be reversed, but they make a little bit more sense that way. Um, we've started to uh, have a 3.10 experimental tree where we have mainline patches, and we'll integrate, and I'll mention that a little bit later, uh, some of the 3.4 work. 3.0, as I said before, is actually depreciated by us. Um, we don't really care for it, it's really old, uh, and we're doing all the work on 3.4, and it's really hard, it's a really tough sell to ask people to port their patches back to 3.0 when we don't even know really people are using it. Um, but as I said earlier, we still need it, uh, hopefully not for long or to some extent for certain use cases. Um, 3.4 right now is mostly in maintenance stage. Uh, we'll accept patches, we'll do some, some minor improvements, but uh, we try to uh, you know, keep it as steady as it is. Um, we do backport patches from, from whatever all winner releases from in their SDKs, you know, if there's fixes or, or new touchscreen drivers with source, uh, we'll do backport those. Um, and we keep it uh, in sync with uh, the long-term uh, re service release of 3.4, so the official upstream uh, 3.4. We have done and will do, there's still lots and lots and lots of bug fixes in it. Um, because, as I said earlier, it's a horrible mess. Um, these people, I guess, code for money, not for passion, like I hope most of us. And equality isn't really important as long as they can release it as quickly as possible. Um, we try 
to limit the number of cleanups in the code um, to the bare minimum uh, so that we can easily, or more, more easily, uh, can do the backports. If you, you know, clean up a whole section, make it all pretty and perfect and awesome, and then you get a new version from all winner, um, which is, you know, basically the same stuff again. Uh, it's starting to get harder and harder to uh, add your own fixes, which you try to avoid. So keeping the clean up to minimum, backporting is easier. I want to talk a little bit more about um, the 3.10 uh, experimental tree that we uh, recently restarted. Um, it's interesting because 3.10, like 3.4, is a long-term release. Long-term service release. Long-term release. Uh, long-term support. Sorry. Um, which means that upstream patches, security fix, and all that uh, will be coming down longer. And there are rumors, or, or I don't think it's, it's a hard fact yet, but uh, Android 5, or one of the next big Android versions, uh, is likely, very likely, to, de de to depend on uh, 3.10, because it's a long-term support. Also interesting to us is because uh, our mainline support started around 3.8, we have, um, in 3.10, we have the most basic, the early uh, long-term, or uh, the, the, the early uh, support. We can bring up a chip uh, using the mainline. You can actually dial it mainline now and bring up a chip. Um, later patches that, you know, as we're, we're developing like crazy maniacs, uh, later patches are actually backport to, or we're trying to backport to 3.10. So in the long term, 3.10 can actually replace 3.4. Um, and 3.10 is really interesting because of new features. Uh, KVM, uh, the kernel virtual machines, like, you know, the, the Zen, the hypervisor thing, uh, wasn't, at, wasn't uh, available for ARM in 3.4. Um, CMA, it's just an example, a continuous memory allocator. We actually did backport it to 3.4 because we really needed it. And so there's more small features that are really interesting that are in 3.10 that were just, would, would cause a lot of work to get in 3.4. The mainline kernel. As I just mentioned, we have actual, you know, in, in three point so much, we have actual uh, a way to bring up uh, the kernel uh, from uh, vanilla uh, Linux. It's all done by the community. All winner has not helped us, or, or well, I suppose they, they answered questions if you really ask them, but they've not really you know, brought any patches in or, or, or helped or start to support anything. It's all community work. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's an upstream, it's right there. Um, we do have our own copy, or copy, we do have our own branch uh, for it. It's the Sunxi development uh, branch. This is where all the new work is going on, stuff that uh, hasn't been merged yet, or stuff that you know, might be revised or, or can't go up yet, but it's just a collection of patches um, so that you can use mainline with the most features available to you if you're willing to take the risk that it's all experimental. And also we have Sunxi next. Um, and the reason why I mentioned these two is because, of course, there's a lot of people always coming in and saying, oh, which branch should I pick, which versions do they have? So I can see next is um, patches that are accepted and will go uh, into the mainline whenever the window's open and whenever there's released. So that's um, as close as you can get without having to patch your own things. Um, I was not supposed to have this one all slow, or all in, in separate parts. Um, the mainline kernel right now supports pretty much, or, or these are the most basic features that it has supported for a little while. Uh, it's also one of the most important things um, to have support for. It's important to uh, be able to bring up your, port, uh, your board. Um, interesting enough, I should mention the watchdog really briefly, really, uh, really shortly. The watchdog is interesting because it's the, actually the only way to reset your, board, your chip. These SOCs, they don't have a special function to power them off. You can't reset them. The watchdog is actually the only bit that's responsible for doing it. And Ethernet is interesting because it is possible to actually run a headless uh, server with these SOCs from mainline um, using a root FS on uh, a network-mounted file system. Since it's such a fast-changing uh, uh, subject, the best way to, to find out, you know, is my feature supported? Well, is there somebody working on it? Yeah. 
is there something I can start working on? That's the link where you can find uh, the most up-to-date uh, information. Right. I wanted to skip this uh, next chapter, but um, I do want to very shortly, briefly touch on it because it's quite important um, to users of uh, these kernels. The FEX file, or uh, you know, the FEX system, uh, I don't think you even know what it stands for, um, is a ini file, configuration uh, file. It's um, a key value pair uh, matching thing, you know, if you want to get a little bit technical. It's actually in binary form, so you need a very, very, very simple a compiler that we uh, support or wrote. And um, the thing why it's important is because all the 3.4 and all the old winner stuff um, is built entirely around it. Um, each of the, the drivers they have, or they support, I guess is the right word, um, parses this file in memory. And um, configures itself, well, like it checks the file, you know, like uh, the driver for the uh, SPI bus, for example. It checks its own section, finds its own section. Am I enabled or not? If it's enabled, it continues. How, which port should I listen to? Which pins should I uh, uh, configure myself to? Um, and why it's important to know is a lot of people I come in and think it's like a magical thing. It's like, it's like this binary file that gets uploaded into the SOC and it magically configures the chip. And, but no, every driver is simply hacked around it. Um, so I see some of you probably thinking, but device tree, isn't that what it's all you know, supposed to do? Isn't that what device tree is for? Yeah, but it's probably older, um, at least for ARM. And even if not, it actually... Uh, comes from, their, uh, from all Windows work before um, their Linux support. They had this thing called Melis, or Mulis, or I don't know, um, which was a very basic media player software. Um, and um, that's where they started to use it. But it's still very important, not because it's such a great system, but because a lot of the OEMs that manufacture these tablets, you know, they learned a little trick. They know they got this, 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 a standard template from all winner. Uh, they modify it horribly most of the time. They don't really know what they're doing. They just know that, you know, they try a few things or God knows. And um, that's the way they set up their tablets. So by remove, you know, by possibly removing that and switching entirely to the device tree, you lose all these users and all these OEMs from even remotely considering uh, using our stuff. But as all good things, is replaced in mainline by the device tree. The new mainline stuff does work properly by the with the device tree. And our intentions anyway, and the other work has started, to um, make both the device tree and the um, FX file script parser thing um, a happy couple in 3.10. This, this way, we can keep the mainline stuff clean, have it all backported, have all the drivers there, and still you know, easily forward port the 3.4 stuff. That's really important to have there that either nobody has started to work on yet or, or it's going to be a huge pain in, in the butt to you know, actually get support of the mainline. Now, now um, all this is interesting and fun. It's all software. I'm sure there's always people interested in hardware because it's, what's the fun of software if you don't have hardware to use it with? There are quite a lot of um, development platforms. Uh, there's even open source hardware platforms. And unfortunately, I didn't get one to show, <laughs> but um, this is the uh, Olimex Lime. Um, and it's very interesting to mention is that Olimex has a lot of uh, hardware platforms that are open source. And this one is also open source hardware. You can download the schematics, the build materials, everything you need to reproduce it. And while most of us can't, it's still very, very resourceful and helpful to have and possibly improve on. Finding bugs, for example. Um, I also find the name interesting or funny. It's called the Lime, which is a pun on the Raspberry Pi, I guess, a little bit. It's about the same price uh, for a faster processor. Um, not, no dependency on a binary blob like the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and it's, I think, a little bit smaller than Raspberry Pi. And small size comparison, because I knew I wouldn't get one to show you guys. It's about, it's really small. Oh, there we go. 
Thank you. This is it. It's really small. It's closed board. Um, if you have not been to the Olimix booth yet, uh, you, can, you, know, you can look one on the inside. It's only fair, of course, to mention the other ones. Um, the QB board. This is QB board one. There's actually QB board two, which is exactly the same. Just a chip swap because they're pin compatible. Um, it's only fair to mention these is uh, as Olimix also uh, sent a few of these to developers. Um, it is open schematic. They have released their schematics, but it's not fully open source. So if you have to choose between the two of them, pick the, yeah, pick the Olimix stuff. Um, and this is the IOMA, I guess it's called, um, board. It's a swapple. It's, I mentioned very, very early on. The left bit, it's a PCMCIA form factor. It's, you know, like those old PCI Express uh, for laptops. So, um, that's the form factor they used. They wanted to make a board so, so that you can put in your laptop, put in your setup box. And the Improv board, which is fully open source hardware, is the first board that uh, allows you to plug in the board and um, use it, I guess, like one of the Olimix boards or, or the Raspberry Pi board, uh, the QB boards. It's, uh, the, the Improv board is open source hardware. The IOMA, interesting, is not, uh, not yet. Um, the creators say that they will release everything, make it fully open source hardware, once they uh, earn back their initial uh, investment, which is, I guess, fair. Um, but besides these uh, open source platforms, open developer boards, which is most interesting to us uh, as developers, there's also a huge number of uh, tablets being sold with these chips, um, HDMI sticks, and um, set the boxes. Uh, HDMI sticks are in the left top, they look like USB sticks, but you plug them into an HDMI port, you supply them with a little bit of power, and you basically have an entire, uh, entire board to play with, limitedly. All winner chips are extremely easy to hack on, or they're safe to hack on, I think is a better uh, word, because they're almost unbreakable, or really, they're unbreakable. Um, it always, it will always boot from the memory card first, which means that if you, 15, 10, 10, which means that if you, uh, if you swap out your memory card, that's, you know, totally brick the device, or, you know, this operating system is totally brick, you swap out the card, you make a new one, it boots again. If you boot from the uh, flash memory, um, and you corrupt that, that's okay. You pop in an SD card, and you can still salvage it. And while for users, that's not really extremely helpful, uh, for developers, it usually means you can just fix whatever you want. I think uh, Luc, who's not here right now, uh, bought a, a broken tablet from, from, from eBay. And uh, the user said it's completely broken, you couldn't fix it, popped in an SD card, and it ran again. Um, if all else fails, all winner has added a safety feature called uh, FEL, or FEL, I don't really know what it stands for. Um, that allow, it's, it's, it's a safety mechanism. It's b built into the chip itself. Um, and it allows you to uh, inject code over USB. It's a special mode. You put the chip in, you connect to your computer over USB, and you can upload binaries. And even that way, recover stuff in case you don't have an accessible MMC. <clears throat> and I see I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, I thought first of going into details what every chip can do and, and you know, how cool it is and, and what it can do. And the wiki is really a much better place to, to learn, does this chip support my feature or you know, can I do this or that with it? Um, these are the four main chips that we support. Um, we have open source drivers for nearly everything. And in theory, it should be uh, FSF endorsable. Nobody has contacted each other yet, probably, and, and you know it depends on what you want to do with it. Um, but so everything you would expect is, is happy, joy, joy, sunshine. You know, great. Please. And there we stop. Hmm? Oh, there we go. Um, but not everything is that. Actually, it's, it, I took huge, huge images, you know, like 4K resolution, whatever I found on the internet, and scaled in nine, figured out how to handle it. It does. It goes. Um, but there's a storm brewing. 
and the Storm is the A31S, or A31, and the A80, which both use PowerVR, which doesn't really have a reverse engineering community around it. Nobody really cares for it. It's a shit um, GPU, but um, ask Luke about it later, Luke, uh, later about it. Which is why it's surprising that Firefox uh, or Mozilla chose that specific chip for their operating system. Sure, it's a little bit fast. It's a quad core, blah, blah, blah. It won't really uh, get support really, support really well, at least not by us. Um, none of the developers have it. None of them are really that interested. I think there's two people that have a board with it. Um, and then there's the new A23. And I made a slide specifically about that is because uh, we finally found one in the wild. Uh, somebody ordered a tablet online, hoping to be an A13. It was actually an, an upgrade to A23. Um, we have the SDK for it, so we can you know, get the kernel running and everything, but we don't have a bootloader, which is important because the bootloader does the memory initialization, and without that, we can't really boot it, which is, you know, you can work around it for now, but it's still annoying. Uh, but it does use the Mali, which is, where Luke comes in with his Lima work. And then, of course, it's very important to mention these ugly things. And it's not by chance that a blob is ugly, but, you know, is the closed source blobs, the closed source propriety uh, files. Um, Mali is one of these blobs. Um, it's, used by, it's the GPU in these uh, boards. Uh, it does the 3D work. And before you start saying, but what, I saw this video last year where you know, Quake 3 was running on, on the reverse engineered work. Uh, that's true. Um, these three talks go specifically all about that, with the small exception being the last one. It's, uh, it's not really about the 3D thing, but I still wanted to mention it, as Luke is very hard working on that. It all happens in the, graphic def the graphics def room later this afternoon. Um, also, we don't have uh, any driver for the GPS. Um, but we do have the debugging symbols. If anybody wants to you know, start we're hacking on that uh, and starts to uh, uh, pick that up and find actually a hardware, because we just know there's two pins for GPS. We don't know uh, what to connect to it. It's, it's possible. Not the touchscreens. I mentioned the touchscreen blobs a few times already. Um, the chip has its own internal touchscreen. And that one is actually supported in mainland uh, already. And then there's the boot ROM, which is a little tiny little bit, bit of code uh, embedded into the chip uh, that's responsible for actually, you know, checking the memory control or the multimedia controller, uh, the checking the NAND flash, check if everything is, uh, you know, coming up. But we have started to, uh, well, I guess you can't say reverse it since it's, it's, it's read-only. You can't ever write it, but we start to document it. Um, and then there's uh, the setter X which uh, the X stands for AV, audio and video, which is responsible for you know, audio decoding and video decoding, which just makes what, these chips really interesting. And then we quickly move over to demonstration. Oh boy. There it is. This is done by 100% open source drivers software. There's no binary blobs, there's no firmware uploaded anywhere. This is all open source stuff. And it's amazing uh, that this works, but let's see if I can show, I think it's this one. The binary bl uh, driver actually, the binary blob, has problems with this one, where we can actually play it back, or the binary one cannot. So you can already see slowly things improving. And I suppose the most interesting bit is that this entire presentation was run on one of these by USB port. <laughs> so you can see it actually functions as a regular desktop. I mean, it's not super fast. But you know, for a lot of people, that's not important. If you just want, you know, if your grandmother just wants to browse some emails, some surf some websites, sure. Um, since I'm running out of time, um, if you want to contribute, if you want to help, the wiki always needs help. Um, if you have a device that's not supported yet, 
we have an excellent new device how-to. If you follow that and, com and contribute your, your fixes or changes, your device will automatically come up, and uh, you're helping us. Um, and we need help porting to these OSs for these specific chips. And of course, kernel patches. And I'm sorry for rushing through the last bit really fast, but uh, we ran out of time, I think, a minute ago. Oh, we're fine. Is there time for questions? Is there time for questions? Oh, yes, there's time for questions. Does anybody have a question? I think we need someone with a microphone. Just one question? Wow. Either I sucked really bad or it was very clear. <laughs> Do you think that uh, for the Lima blobs, uh, will, uh, we will be uh, stick with uh, closed blobs, blobs, or is there some hope that uh, reversing engineering efforts uh, could bring uh, completely, completely open? Uh okay, if I understand your question correctly, it's, is it possible that uh, these you know, devices will be able to run fully open source 3D? Um, yeah. We saw last year with the Limara work done by Luke that uh, he's figured out the entire uh, three GPU. Luke does actually his most, or not most, but a lot of his work on uh, one of these all winner chips. Uh, and he will showcase uh, uh, where he is at right now uh, this afternoon. Uh, in the graphics room? Def uh, graphics right? def room, yeah. Uh, I, I have an, another question, uh, question uh, regarding the boot ROM. Uh, first stage, uh, stage of the boot chain. Uh, do you uh, have you um, uh, encountered uh, um, seen uh, platforms with uh, uh, C uh, Alwin uh, chips, which implement uh, secure boot? Uh, so I was going to talk about uh, the security of these chips and secure boot and all that. I uh, decided not to. I found it to be a little technical for the f first introduction, I guess, to these chips, maybe next year, uh, very briefly. The chips do have support, um, I guess, for, for uh, crypto hashes and all that inside the chip, and they market it, um, their chips that they should be able to do it, but there's just uh, quite a lot of security features. One of the things that I mentioned earlier is that it always boots from um, uh, MMC card first. It's great for users and, and ways to unbreak it, it's horrible for security because you just pop in your SD card, you boot, and, and you can use the file system. So, so in the commercial boards, uh, you think that it is not enforced? Uh, you, uh, you can boot uh, the image? Uh, it, it really, uh, if I understood it correctly, uh, if, if in, the, in, in the future it would be possible to use secure boot with these devices, uh, it depends on the board uh, manufacturer or how the board is set up. You would have to disable certain features uh, so that they can never be used. Um, for example, you could not use the uh, USB on-the-go port, which is uh, used by the file mode. You would have to uh, not map out the uh, MMC pins and always force that way to boot from that and nothing else. And then, in theory, uh, you could get quite far. But uh, I don't see this happening because um, nobody has done it yet. We don't even know if the hardware actually does what it says it should do. Uh, there's, there's some bits in it that you know, enforce a certain uh, uh, crypto things that boot. We don't even know if they work. So it might be likely. I know uh, that for, at least for A31, I think there were some rumors that uh, Windows 8 was going to, or you know, RT was going to maybe support it, but we haven't seen anything uh, forming in that, uh, in that uh, way yet. All right, uh, the time is up. Uh, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you.